So what is the relationship between uh, wavelets, time frequency, starlets, and, uh, and all this? Well, the idea of wavelets, uh, or more general starlet decomposition, is to uh, generate families of elementary functions, building blocks, with uh, specific uh, localization properties in some specific representation spaces, and then try to decompose functions, signals, operators, and, and, and all this as linear superposition of such, uh, such building blocks. Okay, and the, the main idea is to use localization properties in some specific representation space. Okay, so in the case of time frequency analysis, you are looking for concentration in both time and frequency spaces, or in a joint time frequency space, and then you are very close to the standard uncertainty principles. If you look for wavelets, you look for localization in time and scale, and then we'll see that there are some specific uncertainty principles related to time and scale. And actually, uh, for some applications, uh, or theoretical application, the performances of uh, such waveform systems can sometimes be related to uh, or predicted using appropriate uncertainty relations. Okay, so this is essentially what I'm, I'm going to uh, review and describe now. So I will start with the classical uncertainty principles, starting from the variance inequalities, and which measure uh, concentration in terms of localization. Okay, and then we'll see a few a few versions of this, and then I'll move to the discrete uh, situation, finite dimensional situation, for which it's much more difficult to introduce notions such as variance and well, talk about the decay. If you are uh, in finite dimension, then it's difficult to talk about decay. Then you have to introduce other measures of concentration. Then I'll describe the classical results and some uh, by uh, uh, Elad and Brockstein and some uh, improvements that we, we could obtain with Benjamin Rico. And then I'll move to uh, yet another way of describing localization, which is related to the, the entropy. Okay, so let me start uh, with the very, very basics. So the, the standard inequality, I just recall this for to, to settle the nota notations. So if you define the Fourier transformation on L2 by this expression, then the Heisenberg inequality states that if you take any function with norm equal to 1, and then for any value of the time, reference values for the time and the frequency, if you measure the, the concentration of the function f in the time domain by this quantity, which it's usually called the variance. You measure the frequency localization by the equivalent quantity, which is also called the variance in the frequency domain. Then uh, the product of the time variance by the frequency variance has to be larger than a fixed constant, which is 1 divided by 16 pi squared for this specific uh, definition of the, of the Fourier transform. Okay, so, so what this means is that, uh, what everybody knows, if you try to concentrate a function in the time domain, then the price to pay is that the, con the, 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 the function uh, spreads, out, spreads out in the, free in the frequency domain. Okay? So here, the main remark for this one is that if, uh, you measure the, dis uh, well the variance is essentially a, a measure of dispersion away from a reference location. Okay? And this is simply a, a specific choice for measuring localization. So if you want to provide a, a little bit more abstract and, uh, way of introducing such, uh, such uncertainty principles, so what you'd like to do is to move away from time and frequency and try to see whether you can introduce uncertainty principles for different types of representation spaces. So uh, this step was done by uh, Robertson first and then uh, generalized by Schrödinger. Uh, then what you, what you do is the following. The representation spaces are, will be defined essentially as the L2 space of uh, the spectrum of uh, some specific self-adjoint operators. Okay, so here the setting is the following: you introduce a Hilbert space, and if you and you, you take a vector in Hilbert space normalized with norm equal to one, and then for any self-adjoint operator, you, d you introduce the mean and the variance in the state f just by the so the, the mean of uh, the mean of the operator in the state f is just the diagonal matrix element of the operator in state f, and then you define the variance as usual. You take the mean of the square of the operator minus the square of the mean. Okay? And then what you can show quite easily from this is the following. If you introduce two self-adjoint continuous operators on the Hilbert space, you introduce the commutator of those operators and the anti-commutator, okay? then what you get is that the product of the variances of uh, defined in that way, has to be larger than one-fourth of this quantity, which involves the average, the mean of the commutator, and then the mean of the anti-commutator. 
So in general, uh, this quantity uh, is not taken into account, and then you, well, uh, if you take only this one, you get the, Sch the Robertson inequality, and then if you take this one into account, you get the, the Schrodinger inequality that was proposed six months later. Okay. So if you just take examples, if you want to be back to the Weil-Eisenberg inequality, you take for A the infinitesimal generator of modulations, so this is just pointwise multiplication by time, you take for B the derivative, multiplied by I to make it self-adjoint, and then if you apply this inequality, uh, if you apply the Robertson inequality, so if you avoid the anti-commutator, this is what you get, and then this is nice because you have a, con a constant. If you, uh, I, I don't have a slide for that, but if you use the, the, the complete inequality, then you get an extra term here, which actually depends on F, okay, which is a little bit of, well, which is kind of a, a bad news, but I'm, I'm not going to, to talk about that today. Okay, so now uh, what happens if you, if you want to move to other, other settings? Okay, so forget about time frequency and let's try to go to time scale. Okay, so for time scale, what you have to, to do is to take for A the infinitesimal generator of dilations, which is this operator. So essentially T times F of T plus uh, one half of F of T, okay. And uh, um, yeah, there may be a mistake here. But yeah. Okay, I'll correct that. And for B, you take ge uh, a generator of translations. If you compute the commutator, this is what you get. And again, if you take the Robertson inequality, you, you get the so-called Clouder inequality. Okay. And now what changes here is that the, the upper bound here uh, depends explicitly on F. Okay. And then what happens, and that's one of the reasons why uh, this inequality was uh, criticized. Uh, what this implies is that if, even if you find an F which for which in inequality becomes an equality, okay, this doesn't mean that you have minimized the product of variances because you can still play with the, with, with the, with the bound. Okay. So this problem was solved uh, later on by, uh, uh, by Altes, who, who showed that actually you shouldn't consider the scale itself as a variable, but rather the logarithm of the scale, because if you, t if you define the... So th this is the, the, the equality th which, which you get, and if you look at this, uh, so this is, the, this is the variance in the frequency domain, this is the variance in the scale domain, and actually the scale is a multiplicative variable, it should and should be treated as such. Okay, so it's not natural to take scale uh, one minus scale two, and actually if you go to logarithm, then you get the product, the log of the difference of logarithms and then you are back to the same situation. Okay, so this is what you get and here you get indeed the, the fact that the upper bound depends on the, depends on, on the state. Okay. Uh, okay, so just to show you that, uh, well, even though it's not perfect, this uh, Schrodinger, uh, Robertson-Schrodinger inequality has some interest, it can still be extended to, uh, to, extend to other settings and in particular it can be extended to the case of periodic functions. Okay, so suppose now that you, you consider the, uh, the space of uh, periodic functions, okay, and then you can introduce the operators A and B, uh, defined in this way. So A uh, should replace uh, T, uh, A of F of T replaces the T F of T that we had before, and B is still the infinitesimal generator of, of uh, rotations. Okay, then you, it turns out that you can you can do all the calculations as, as before, and the main thing is that you, you, have to, uh, you have to replace the average by the trigonometric average of, of the function. If you, have a, if you have a periodic function, you have to look for wha what is the mean of the periodic function. Uh, a way to represent the mean is to uh, consider the periodic function as a function defined on the circle, and then if you introduce the mean in this way, the mean becomes a complex number, which is inside the, inside the, in, inside the disk. Okay? And then if you do the calculation in, in this way, uh, this was proved by Breitenberger in 83. You can still prove an uh, uncertainty relation where this represents the variance in the periodic time domain, this is the variance in the frequency domain, and again, you get a uh, universal <coughs> constant with the bad property that in this case you cannot have equality. Okay. You have to assume that epsilon is different from zero because you want to divide by that, and actually you cannot have equality. Okay. And then the question is, uh, well, I mean th there is a recent paper by uh, Martin Vetterli and, and co-workers where they, they, they produce an algorithm that, uh, that optimizes the, 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 the concentration for uh, functions, joint con uh, con time frequency concentration for functions defined on the circle. Okay. And actually, 
you can come out with a closed form expression for the optimizers, which take the form of special functions called the, the, the Mathieu sines and cosines. Okay, so this is just to show you that, well, it's still possible to do something uh, using variance inequalities, even in situations where you are periodic and then you cannot really talk about decay of such quantities. Okay, but clearly this is not going to work in all situations. And in particular, uh, suppose that you have, you want to find an uncertainty principle that, that would hold for, say, a uh, finite length signal of, uh, signals of, of length 100. Okay, so how can you define the localization of such a signal, in particular if you introduce boundary, uh, periodic boundary conditions or something like this. So in, in, well, in such situations, well, you don't necessarily have to change the notion of localization, but it makes sense to search for other notions of lo localizations. So this is what I'm going to talk about now in particular case of the, the dis in particular case of discrete uh, discrete vectors. Okay, so uh, the for me well the, the, the major contribution to, to this is an equality that was proposed by Elad and Bruckstein uh, following earlier work by Dono and, and Wu. Okay? And here the idea is the following. Uh, we are going to consider representation spaces which are the space of coefficients of a vector with respect to two different orthonormal bases. Okay, and then after, after that we'll replace bases by frames. Okay, and then you can ask the question, okay, I have a vector, I can expand my vector with respect to basis number one, I can expand my vector, vector with respect to basis number two, and uh, if I suppose that the coefficients, the, my first set of coefficients is very concentrated in a way to be defined uh, now, what does this tell me to uh, concerning the concentration of my second set of coefficients. Okay. So here the concentration is going to be measured by using the L0 quasi-norm, so you just count the number of non-zero coefficients. And then what you can prove quite easily is, is the following. Suppose that you are given two orthogonal bases in a uh, space of dimension n, and for any vector in Cn, you denote by a and b the respecting coefficient sequences with respect to the two bases a and b. And then what you can show is that the product of those uh, support sizes has to be larger than 1 divided by this quantity. And this quantity only depends on the two orthogonal bases, and it's just the maximum value of the, uh, uh, of the, of the cross gram matrix of the two bases. Okay? So what does that mean? It m this means that... <coughs> this means that Suppose that you take twice the same basis, okay? then this number is equal to 1, and then what you get is that if for any non-zero vector, uh, the product of the uh, sizes of the coefficient sequences has to be larger than 1, which doesn't tell much. Okay? Uh, if the two bases are a little bit more different, then this number is smaller, okay? and then you get a bound that really starts to tell you something. Okay? So, uh, in particular, uh, the particular interesting case was the case of the Kronecker basis, the, the canonical basis, and the Fourier basis. And in this case, you can show that this quantity is equal to 1 divided by the square root of n. And this is actually the best you can achieve. Okay? So, in a way, this quantity tells you how different the two bases and the consideration are. And uh, in, the, in the finite dimensional case, uh, the, the, the most different uh, pair of bases you can get is the canonical basis and the Fourier basis. Okay, so you, you can you cannot do better. And in particular, then once you have this result, you can ask, okay, but uh, what are the, the the signals? What are the sequences that optimize such inequalities? Do they look like uh, finite dimensional Gaussian functions, something like you would expect? And actually, the answer is no. And the answer in this case is that the optimizers are the periodized Dirac. Which is a bit, uh, which was a, a bit surprising, but I mean, this can be, this can be, this can be proven. And actually, what you can show is that this bound is sharp if the two bases under consideration are uh, so-called mutually unbased, which means that uh, if you look at those scalar products, they are all equal in absolute value to a constant one divided square root of n. And this is a case of the uh, canonical and Fourier basis. Okay, so essentially, for this business, canonical and Fourier basis are optimal. Okay. So, well, this is just an illustration. If I, uh, if I show you, so this is kind of Gaussian function, this is a periodized Dirac, and if I ask you which one of these two vectors is optimally localized, concentrated, if you think in terms of localization, you would answer the Gaussian because it's localized around the origin, but actually what the results tell you is that this one, is the, the, Dirac, the periodized Dirac, is more sharply concentrated. Okay. So, so the, the infinite dimensional words and the finite dimensional world are 
in a way completely different. Okay, so now uh, uh, how far can you go in this direction? It turns out that you can, you can uh, generalize these results uh, if, you f if you forget about orthogonal basis. Uh, so what we have learned from wavelet and time frequency theory is that sometimes it's nice to escape from the, the world of the basis and go to, to, to frame theory. Okay, so can we get uh, similar inequalities in the case of frames? It turns out that you can, do, you, can, you can do essentially the same thing and generalize the proofs. So suppose that we are given two frames for Hilbert space, so U and V again. So those two frames are, are relate, defined in terms of the frame constants. So saying that U is a frame for the space means that if you look at the sum of squares, this means that essentially you have some kind of uh, a uh, weak form of uh, Planchard, Planchard equality, so that the L2 norm of the coefficient sequence is more or less equivalent to the L2 norm, to the, to the, to the square norm of the, of the vector. Okay, and if I denote by U tilde and V tilde uh, corresponding dual frames, so essentially the frames that you need to reconstruct your, your vector, okay, then what you have to do is to, re what you can do is to replace the coherence that was defined before, what, which was the maximum value of those uh, of those uh, inner products by this quantity, which is essentially an LP, LR norm of those uh, coefficient matrix coefficient sequence. Okay? And then for any vector, I denote again by A and B, the uh, family of analysis coefficients. And then what you can prove is, is the following. Uh, first of all, if you take any vector, if A and B denote the analysis coefficients, namely the, the inner product with the, with the two frames, if you look at this, the product of the support size of those two vectors, this is necessarily larger than this quantity, which is one divided by the, the product of those two generalized coherence that we had before. So this includes, as a particular case, the, the standard coherence, but actually this turns out to improve uh, in the, 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 previous, the previous bound. Okay? And then the question is, uh, when can this inequality be an equality? Okay. And if you look, if you look at the proof, you you actually realize that you can get an equality only if the two coefficient sequences are constant on their support in absolute value, <coughs> which is the case of the period as the arc actually. Okay, and you also need those uh, sequence of scalar products to be also constant on their support. So this means that actually you can get an equality. Uh, only if you are very close to the case of a mutually unbiased uh, basis or, or, or frames, so that the case of uh, canonical frame and Fourier frame. Okay, <coughs> okay. So let me skip this one. So the question is: uh, Does this result really improve uh, the, the result by Elad and Bergstein? So if you if you if you want to, well. I mean, there, there, there is a theorem that shows that uh, this result is better, but if you want to, 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 to check that visually, then what you can do is just generate random bases, then compute those coherence and, uh, as a function of R. So the usual coherence is obtained for R equal to 1. And then what you can see is that for randomly generated bases, uh, the minimum value is obtained in this case for R around 1.15 or something like this. So you indeed you improve a little bit, not much, the, the, the bound by going to those uh, uh, those uh, generalized coherences. Okay. <coughs> so uh, in so in the case of general frames, so there there is room for generalizations, but uh, I'm not going to to, to discuss this. Okay. How, how much time do I have? Uh, five more minutes. Okay. So let me just. Uh, Jump to the last uh, to, to to the last example of uh, uncertainty principles. So, still in the discrete setting, okay. Uh, so here in in that case, what we have done is to use the, the support size of a vector to measure the concentration. Okay. So it turns out that you can introduce other quantities that would that will provide you with finer or more precise measures of concentration, and uh, those quantities are provided by uh, the, the entropies, in particular the, the Rényi entropies, which are essentially given by logarithm of the uh, some LP norms of the co normalized coefficient sequences. Okay. So essentially, if you have a vector you can consider the, the, the sequence of coefficients of that vector with respect to a frame or a basis, then you can normalize it so that the, the squares of those coefficients give you a probability distribution, and then you can introduce ent entropies. And actually, those entropies provide measures of concentration for this coefficient sequence. So let's look at this in a very, very simple example. So here, I just take the vector P1 minus P, 
okay? And I plot here the various Reni entropies as a function of p between 0 and 1. Okay? Then what you can see is that if p equ equals 0 or p equals 1, then all those entropies are equal to 0. Okay? But this corresponds to a case where you are extremely well localized. Okay? And if you take p equals 1 half, all those entropies are maximum. But this is the case where your vector of length 2 is maximally spread out. Okay? And if you look at those all those entropies, they provide you different measures for this, this localization. Okay. So again, let me uh, consider the case of the two frames U and V with frame bounds A and B. Okay. So we have to introduce some constants because we have to introduce some normalizations uh, between the frames. The constant which will play a role here, an important role here, will be uh, this sigma, which is essentially the product of the two frame bound ratios. Okay. So this guy is equal to 1 if you have two tight frames. Okay. Then what you can show is the following. So suppose, so again, the question is, you have two frames or two bases, then you want, to, uh, you want to expand a vector with respect to those two frames or those two bases. And then uh, the question is, if you know that uh, one, uh, one vector is very well localized in one domain as measured by some entropy, some quantity, what does this tell you concerning the concentration of that vector in the other domain? So still this uncertainty problem. Then it turns out that, again, in this case, you can come out with an, with an inequality that involves those Rényi entropies, okay, which tells you the, f the following. So suppose that you have two frames or two bases. Suppose that uh, take alpha between 1 half and 1, and then take beta uh, such that 2 beta is the conjugate of 2 alpha. Okay. Then if you take any vector uh, x, uh, you denote by A and B the sequence of, of coefficients of x with respect to those two frames, so the inner product with, with the frame vectors. Then what you have is that the, uh <coughs> the concentration, the, the, the spread of the first vector of coefficients measured by the entropy alpha plus the spread of the other one measured by beta, this has to be larger than this constant, which is nice, okay, because it doesn't depend on alpha and beta plus this one, which is not so nice, because it, it depends on alpha. Okay? But uh, what happens is that if you have two type frames, sigma is equal to 1, and then this one disappears. Okay? And then again, what you get is a result which doesn't depend on the way you measure the concentration. Okay? For any alpha, you get an equi inequality li like this. And in particular, if you take the, the limit as alpha goes to 1, what you get is the Shannon entropy, which is also a standard way to measure the, the concentration of, of vectors. Okay, so after that you can prove a number of other inequalities which are essentially boring, but maybe interesting in some situation. Okay, and so what I would just would, would like to mention is the fact that uh, this bound can also be improved by introducing these uh, generalized coherences that I, I, I talked about before. But the bounds we obtain are still not optimal. This is something <coughs> we could prove. Okay, so the last point I would like to make, I'm not going to go into the formulas of this, is the fact that, uh, again, you can ask the question, when are those bounds optimal? When can they be, when do they have a chance of being a, an, an equality? And again, uh <coughs> again, uh, what we could prove is that uh, if, you have any, if the inequality is an equality, then again, the coefficient sequences have to be constant on the support. So again, you are very close to the case of periodized DR. Okay, <coughs> so let me just, just finish. So what we have here, what, what I've shown here is a family of new or different ways of measuring concentrations that, that are useful for either functions or vectors in finite or infinite dimensional situation. In many situations, you can prove uncertainty inequalities using those measures of, uh, of concentration. Okay? And the point I would like to make is, is the fact that in the infinite, dimension, in infinite dimensional situation, very often the optimizer for uncertainty relation is related to, to the Gaussian function. Okay. While if we go to finite dimension situation, we can get optimal, uh, optimal results only in situations that are very close to periodize <coughs> the arc function. And actually, the, well the, the, the conjecture, uh, a natural conjecture would be that if you, if, you, uh, well, if you are led to the Gaussian in infinite dimensional situation, the reason might be that you are always working in Hilbert space or L2 spaces that enforce some decay at infinity. 
And my conjecture would be that it if it were possible to measure the locali localization properties of distributions, it's very likely that, uh, again, the optimizer would not be the Gaussian anymore, but the periodized Dirac, which has many properties in common with the Gaussian, in particular the fact that it's equal to its own Fourier transform. Could you repeat the last statement? Maybe just repeat the last statement. The, 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 last, the last statement, uh, I was saying that uh, well, the, the, the periodized Dirac distribution has an important property in, in common with the Gaussian function, which is that if you take its Fourier transform, you still get a periodized Dirac by the Poisson summation yeah, formula. Poisson. Yeah, that's what I want to and so uh, for me, that it would be a natural candidate for the uh, uncertainty optimizer in, uh, in a wider sense. But I don't know how to compute the variance of uh, periodized Dirac. I don't know how to compute the entropy, so if anybody knows how to do that, I think the results should be something like this. Thank you very much.